Today we're going to talk about Tuvan or Tuvinian language. Before we start, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Yulia and I'm a language teacher. I work and live in Moscow, but originally was born in Tuva Republic, so in the city called Kazil, which is the capital of it. Um, so I'm passionate about languages, I'm passionate about cognitive science, to understand how we study, how we learn. And I also run a small project with my colleague, which is called Extra, we create teaching materials. So, but today's workshop would never happen without my friend, her name is Aidana Mangush. And she, um, we studied together at the university, and she lives in Kazil, in Tuva Republic. Uh, so this beautiful lady helped me a lot with some grammar things and some pronunciation things. Because um, I would like to tell that uh, as soon as I was born in Tuva, but when I was a kid, my parents, uh, my parents left, so we moved to another part of Siberia. But I still have uh, relatives there, aunties, and my grandparents were born there. So like every summer, I visited my grandpa and my grandma. So I am not a native speaker of Tuvan language, but I spoke it when I was a kid in the kindergarten. So you have to speak it because there are not so many Russian kids. So, uh, but um, for example, my grandma, she still uses a lot of words like um, talking about food or talking about like, goodbye or good day using uh, Tuvan language. So that's why it's like pretty often I hear that during, um, during the day. But uh, Aidana helped me a lot with, and thank you, uh, thank her for that. Uh, so this workshop, I would like to divide into several categories, like where is Tuva? So first of all, because even in Russia, there are not so many people who know where is it. So a, a little bit of history of this land um, and creation of the writing system of Tuvan language and what makes uh, Tuvan special, in my point of view, of course. So. And I would like to start with uh, some uh, geographical feature. So uh, Tuva is situated on the south, or southern part of Siberia. Uh, so it's in the border with Mongolia and Krasnoyarsk region, uh, Hakasia particularly. So and on the right, on the left, there is Altai Mountains, and on the right, you can see the lake, the Lake Baikal. So that's not a big territory, uh, but it's a very diverse area because. Uh, it has it has absolutely amazing nature. Uh, it has both forests and desert and camels, so you could see many many interesting features in this land. So who knows what maybe what have you heard about uh, Tuva first? Maybe there is something that that is very famous and you heard about that. Maybe you've seen these guys. Yeah, so they call Alash. And in, I think in some, several years ago, they gave a presentation, a performance actually at Ted Baltimore. And if you never heard how these, uh, how they, you know, they, they create these sounds with uh, different pitch levels. So they have um, upper pitch level and lower pitch level, and they can do it simultaneously at the same time. So it's like unbelievable articulation. Um, so I would like to show you little bit of it. Soon may you walk to Laulan, Sonare, they love Laran, Sonare, they love Laran, Sonare, So that that sounds like that. And if you if you watch that on TED, they actually at the end of this TED presentation, they they do it with the uh, with one rapper who uh, who also do the beatbox. So plus this, so it's something incredible actually. 
Uh, so next we go to the a little bit of a history. So uh, why uh, and what what is so special about this this land is that uh, it actually belonged to to many tribes and many uh, uh, many countries. Uh, so at the beginning, like six or seventh century, there were Kyrgyzstan people who were living in uh, in this area. Uh, then the Mongols conquered this area. And that's why the uh, majority of people of uh, Tuva, so they were speaking uh, Mongolian language. After the, after the collapse of Mongol Empire, uh, so there was a Chinese dynasty who took this land. And again, part of, of part of the population of this land, so they were speaking Chinese, part of this population was speaking Mongolian plus uh, to one language. So basically, during this period of time, from 6th century until 18th, 17th century, to one, uh, absorbed uh, a lot of Mongolian words, a lot of, uh, not a lot of, but some of them Chinese words. For example, like um, uh, the word Beijing, so they in Tuva call it Beijing, so how that sounds like something Chinese, right? So like uh, Pekin, right? So the, basically this is a bowel, it means a bowel for food, so they, they borrow it from, from China. And then after, after the collapse uh, of, um, not the collapse, but after, after the uh, Chinese empire, so uh, Tuva was thinking what to do next and like where, uh, where to go, but uh, the region during 18th century was really Altai influenced and also uh, during this period of time, started from 1830, there was a gold rush uh, in this area and there were a lot of uh, Russian, there is no more left, I'm sorry. <laughs> So there were uh, a lot of Russian uh, Russians who were coming to this land so to work or to mine gold. So for example, my grandma, uh, she was born in one of the gold miners areas so where so her, her parents were mining uh, gold. And as you can see, the architecture of, uh, of these towns were actually looking like pretty much like Chinese. So that was at the beginning of trade uh, between China and Russia, the agricultural development, because uh, before these, uh, they were usually tribes, so who, uh, who basically were, um, you know, moving from one part to another, but uh, from the beginning of gold rush, they finally settled and they started thinking about the cities. So, and from uh, 1914, uh, so Tuva asks for uh, Russian uh, prote uh, protectorship, and so now it it had the good relationship with both Mongol and China and and Russian Empire. So. Uh, then, uh, during 1920, 1930, there was the capital built. At the beginning, it was called Bilatsarsk, so literally mean the White City. But after um, after the communist revolution in 1917, so they uh, changed it into Kazil, which literally means red. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and the capital was built. Well, it was built earlier, but now that became a capital finally. And uh, interesting period of time uh, during um, 1920, 1940, uh, is that there was a uh, there was a country called Tanu Tuva, and the country actually was independent. They were seeking for independence with protectorship uh, for um, from both sides of Mongolia and both sides of Russia. They had their own um, money, they had their own stamps, the flag, but they still, as you can see on the flag, they still used old Mongolian language. So, and from the beginning of, of this period of time, the government of Tanu Tuva, they started thinking that if they are independent country, they need independent language. So they don't want to use old Mongolian anymore. So that's why they started thinking about who they can ask to create their own um, alphabet. And um, uh, you know this guy, right? Yeah, this is Richard Feynman. Uh, uh, so he's a, um, he was a very, very famous theoretical physicist. And once he was, he was very um, famous for, you know, for his curiosity, for his curiosity. So when once he, um, he called his friend and said, oh, wait, do you know this country? This country exists, uh, that was called Tanu Tuva. And his friend said, I never heard about this such country, you know? And Feynman said, we, we must go there. We must find how, how, to, how to get there, you know? 
and uh, they spent, Richard Feynman, uh, so he was like asking for a visa to Soviet Union to get into this land for like several years, but unfortunately, um, as soon as he, it was Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, it was very difficult to get into the country, uh, especially for people from the United States, so that's why uh, he got his visa, unfortunately, one year or one month before his death, so uh, he never actually managed to get inside uh, Tuva, but his friend visited it after Richard Feynman's death, and um, and he wrote uh, the book called uh, Tuva Obast, and it's dedicated to famous uh, physicists. It's actually a really funny book. Um, so after uh, Tanu Tuva started, uh, became an independent, uh, so they started thinking about their own writing system. So they still, there was the, to one language was the combination again of Mongolian, some, a lot of Russian words, a lot of borrowings were from, um, uh, from Russian, of, uh, everything which concerns technology, agriculture, such proverbs, uh, adverbs, sorry, as like уже, already, like еще, like steel or karoche, like briefly. So all of these words uh, were borrowed from, from Russian language. Also everything which uh, was connected with culture, like uh, theater, like theater, uh, or like um, like music, like musica, right, and, and many others. So also like things like a tragedia, commedia, like tragedy, comedy, so they also were borrowed from Russian, but modified a little bit. So, um, in order to create their own, in order to create their own writing system, um, there was one man. Uh, he was a lama, a Buddhist lama. He was born in uh, in Tuva, and he got the education in um, in Tibet. So his name was Mangush Lapsan Chimit, and uh, he he's in, in the center. And he was one of the first creators of um, of new Tuvan alphabet. Um, unfortunately, his like you know destiny was not really happy. He was uh, executed. Uh, but uh, during ten years, uh, from 1930 until 1940, he was creating and working with some of his uh, colleagues on the alphabet, and they used Yanalif. Who who has ever heard about that? Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, so. Yanalif was a system uh, created also by Soviet Union linguists. Um, the system was in, in 1930, 1920, they had the intention to translate Arabic alphabets of uh, Soviet Union uh, states so into the um, into the like Latin alphabet so like such regions as Kyrgyzstan Kazakhstan uh, Tatarstan in in Russia so they they used Yanalif to translate their um, to basically translate their alphabet into Latin so they use Latin alphabet but there was a problem because for example Latin alphabet did not uh, fully show the beauty of the vowel system of Tuvan languages as, as well as many other languages in, in, in post-Soviet Union. But uh, anyway, so um, Amangus Chimit used that uh, Yanalif system to create um, the language for, for Tuva. So, but still, uh, there were a lot of um, a lot of Yanalif use, plus they were still, they used a lot of uh, old Mongolian um, alphabets, alphabet system. And uh, so during uh, 1920 until 1940, they still use like both alphabets. Some people use this Yanalif, some people use uh, Old Mongolian, and there was again the problem because um, there, wasn't, there wasn't the union, there wasn't, they were not united. So that's why um, in 1940, uh, and somewhere in 1930, people started thinking we need Cyrillic because uh, definitely an alif was not working uh, as beautifully as they thought that that would be. So um, that's why they were <coughs> two really famous Russian linguists. There was uh, Polyvanov Evgeny and Palmbach Alexander. Um, so Pol uh, Polyvanov Evgeny is actually uh, famous for create. He was creating alphabets for many republics. So in in USSR, so like um, he was a famous linguist trying to interpret local alphabets and trying to transfer local alphabets into 
um, into Cyrillic. And so he created the system by adding three letters into the Russian alphabet. How many letters are in the Russian alphabet? How many? 33, thank you, Richard, right? So <laughs> there are 33 letters in Russian alphabet, right? So uh, Polyvanov added uh, three more. You can see them there in the red, right? So because uh, Russian alphabet system does not, um, you know, cannot show the beauty of these sounds. So this is uh, the sound ö, n, and u. So like and you can see the letters monument dedicated to these sounds in uh, Tova Republic, right? So they are really proud of it. Uh, so basically, they use the Cyrillic, like A, B, V, G, D, and, and, and so on, plus adding uh, these three letters. And that, that, again, that wasn't a full, you know, decision, because it's still, there were still some sounds uh, which were not represented in the alphabet, especially um, because Tuvan language has uh, four main dialects. So there's a northern dialect, central dialect, and there is a Tajinsky uh, uh, dialect. Uh, this is the major part of Tuva, and that's where you know a lot of shamans are living. Uh, and the thing is, is that uh, especially for Tajin dialect, uh, so. It, it didn't have representation of their sounds, but anyway, there was better decision, and uh, Polyvanov uh, and Polyvanov, they just didn't have time, so they created what they could. But it's still, the alphabet is still, uh, you know, working. So then we go into what make what is so special about one language. So basically, if we're talking about uh, the uh, the language family, so to one, how do you think to where does it dedicate it? So where is that? Is it Slavic language or Turkic? Right, exactly. So, if basically, if you speak to one, you understand Turkish. So, pretty much, because when I was at university, I was living in in one university dorm with Aydana Mangush, who I show show you before, right? And she said when she was in Tuva Republic, uh, sorry, when she was in Turkey, so she understood what Turkish people were, were, were talking. So they they basically then understood many. Uh, they can understand many people from like uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan as well. So because they all Turks and Tatar in Tatar Republic in in Russia as well. So uh, this one is interesting <clears throat> because uh, I guess people uh, people in Tuva they mainly you know they surrounded by beautiful nature. <clears throat> they uh, they see the. Uh, time changes, you know, like they see beautiful winters and summers and, and forests, and most of them are hunters. So you could see that the natural world calendar, uh, it has its own interpretation. Now, for example, like white month, how do you think what month is that? January, okay, <laughs> good guess. Okay, what about last cold month? It's Siberia, don't forget, yeah? April, I would say June, but okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. What about wet snow month? <laughs> Green sprout months. Green sprout months like seems like never happen actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> to be honest, okay. Row deer drift months. <laughs> so April something. No, no. Okay. So it's difficult to guess, but you could see that Ak I. I means month in Tuva. <clears throat> so this is a uh, white month, so February. Uh, Tuva is a, a severe, has severe climate. So uh, I remember when I was a kid in winter, that's like minus 40, minus 45 easily. And when it's summer, uh, it's like plus 35. So basically it's a huge difference between summer temperature and winter temperature. So that's why if it's February, it's super cold. If it's July, it's super hot. So um, then we see the March, or like I right as a wet snow month. Then April, months of setting the dogs on the wild animals. Then we have Shamur Ayu. This is May, this is green sprout months. Uh, then we have, for example, June. So it's not the last cold month, right? Uh, is Baik Tazar Ai. Months when it's difficult to, to, to get the bird bark. How do you think what is a bird bark for? It's for, for making crafts, <clears throat> for making crafts and some things for, for houses like uh, like baskets, you know, so 
they create something. So, for example, but but then goes July, and this is a month when it's really difficult to oh sorry, very easy to get the birch bark, but it's difficult in June. Then September, that's the starting beginning of hunting, so it's a raw deer drift month. Then sable hunting in October, so Aldilar I. Then Urgular I, it's November, that's non stopping snow wind months. Again, winter, yeah, <laughs> finally. <coughs> then we have December, this is the first snow months. And then last cold months, that's going to be January. Song Gu Sok I. Yeah. Say again? Uh, well, no, first, first is January, so, but I, I don't know, that's in all books it's represented like that, starting from February. I also was curious, I asked a lot of my friends like why, and they also cannot explain why, so it starts from February. So, maybe, I think it's connected with uh, some, you know, like local calendars of all times, and now they cannot explain, I ask as well. Uh, Alright, so, uh, Basically, the natural world calendar represents uh, the, the nature around, but that's that's not all. If we're talking about hunt, hunting, because Tuvan people are hunters, <clears throat> and for Tuvan people, um, they they believe that if you name if you name the animal by its name, for example, adik uh, means bear, but if you call it adik, uh, you have bad relationship with him. So, or, you know, he may be not going to be treating you well, right? So you don't want it, this to be happen, so that's why you, you don't call him a dick. You call him something like Hairagan or Ire, which means God or Grandpa. So animals have nicknames, and usually people call them by their nicknames in order not to, you know, not to to be to be, to treat them well. So let's say, then for example, <laughs> no, yeah, that's sweet, right? So then an animal with a blanket. How'd you like it, right? Because he basically lives in, under the snow sometimes, right? Then we have flat-footed, like chill back malk. Then we have uh, chaglir. This is fat animal. Actually, fat animal goes with many many other animals. Like roe deer is also a fat animal, right? Then, uh, second really, really um, important animal for Siberia, this and for Tuvan, this is uh, sable, right, or sobel in Russian, right, they call Aldi. Aldi also has a nickname, uh, it's called Charash An. Charash An is a, means beautiful animal. Uh, then we have Tosh. Tosh is a moose. There are a lot of mooses in Tuvan Republic. And they call it Yong Ang, also fat animal. The same as bear, right? You gotta be careful. All right, then we have uh, the red deer. Red deer is Sun, and it's Yong Ang, fat animal. Again. <laughs> so there are no skinny animals uh, in Tuva, right? <laughs> so they're all quite fat. Um, again, so. Uh, because Tuvana, a lot of them are hunters, and this is you could see the um, a Tuvinian person uh, like they they use birds a lot in hunting, and uh, of course they use horses as well. So a lot of um, a lot of hunting words uh, or words connected with uh, forests, they also have their nicknames. Like for example, uh, or, or their special names. Like for example, these words you never find in Russian. By, I mean by only one word, So, but there are special words in Tuvan language. Like for example, Belgi, this is a tree or branch of a tree that they put uh, in the forest to indicate the path. So if you could see this tree, well, actually in Russian we have the word Tur, uh, this is the stone, uh, the, 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 the stone pile which you put to indicate the path in the forest. But uh, uh, Tuvan people use the sticks and or the, the special small trees. So, for example, Urgu, uh, this is when the person stays nights and days out of uh, out of home, so not being at home, probably hunting. Uh, suvarta means uh, scattered through the food without permission. So, it both, uh, like I asked Aidana, what is that about? And she said it's for both animals, you know, like when animals eat food, for example, without your permission, right? Or, for example, when little kids eat something without permission, so... 
or like dogs, you know. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of words connected with uh, milk because um, Tuvan people have a lot of camels as well uh, and horses and they milk horses uh, and that's and goats as well. So that's why they have tashta. That's when you milk a deer. Tashdemne, uh, sh uh, sorry, shaydemne. It's make a sour milk. So like kefir, you know, like in in. Um, in Turkey or in Russia, we have a lot of uh, milk products like that. So kara uh, this is feed, uh, or somebody, you, you feed somebody not with mother's milk. So, uh, and also sute is to add milk into the tea. So sute, right, so British people have a lot of sute probably, right? <laughs> So, okay, well, what I that was vocabulary. Of course, there are way more words connected with hunting, connected with um, um, actually or orientation in the forest. And this is especially um, interesting for, and uh, this is a special feature of uh, Tajin dialect. So, because they are hunters, they're like true hunters in us. so that's why they uh, use a lot of words, and there is a special book which is called Tajin Dialect uh, of Tuvan Republic. Um, you can find it, I think, uh, online, but unfortunately, it's in Russian, so uh, I, I didn't find in in English as well. So there are the bunches of words uh, which you never, for example, I never seen in Russian such words, but you find them in Tuvan. <clears throat> but what is special again about the grammar? So um, maybe there is there, there is such a grammar tense uh, in other languages, but at least I never seen them. So this is the gra grammatical tense, which is I literally called behind your eyes. So this is the present tense. When something happened, like let's say if you compare the present continuous tense in English, but when something happened and you cannot see it. So basically you, you only hear or you know that something is happening, but you cannot uh, see it. So this is the special tense for that. So for example, it can be used when you, uh, when you uh, tell a fairy tale to the kids. You tell the story, you're not a witness of this story, but you know that the story is happening somewhere and you tell it to the kids. So uh, then uh, you tell about hunting. Like for example, there is an example of So this is the wolf is howling in the forest, but you cannot see it, right? Or there. Then Mirajdir, so this is the thunder rambles, but you only hear that. So basically, if something is happening, right, outside, like we know, for example, that uh, there is a track two or track one lectures are going, right? We know that they are happening, but we cannot see them, right? So we can use this uh, tense. Uh, how how do how do they use them? So they basically there is a affixation. So to one uh, to one grammar works pretty much like Russia, so uh, Russian, you need to use a lot of affixation, suffixes and prefixes in order to change the word, the same as like in, in Turkish pretty much. So, <clears throat> and you guys have uh, have the papers, right, a little bit, so uh, where you could see the, ge uh, the geography, the geographical map, then you could see the example of Yanaliv on the right, um, Russian plus to one, three letters, so to one alphabet right now in 2019. Right, and some basic phrases, right? Okay, but because uh, I know that some of you read Cyrillic, right? So who can try to say hello? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Say again. Amir Mendi. Amir Mendi. All right, how would you, this is formal, how would you say, like, hello, just privet? A key, right? How would you say, how are you? Kalu? Hire? Tursen, mm-hmm. Hai hire Tursen, all right, how would you say, fine, thank you? A key, chetardim, azerbas. Mm -hmm. So Azerbaijan is a really cool word because you can use it like as you welcome and thank you. So a lot of meaning, right? What What is your name? Adnar Kamil. Mm -hmm. Then so my name is Meng Adim, right? Meng Adim, right? Nice to meet you. 
Rungur Tur. All right, and please again. Azurbas, right? Azurbas, right? Thank you. Right, that's going to be Chatterdim. Mm -hmm. You are welcome. Azurbas, right? As I said, is a good word, right? You, you, you need it. That you are welcome again. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh huh. No. Chalk, right? Uh, excuse me. Buruluk Boldum. Right. So uh, actually, it's not only for getting attention, this is like, I'm sorry as well, right? Uh, goodbye. Bairlik, right? Uh, but goodbye informal, usually people say, my grandma still s says it every time I call her, so at the end of the conversation, she says, cha. Cha. Right, cha. Cha means goodbye, but it also means like, okay, so, or like, I got you, or I understand what you're talking about, so it's a, it's a really cool word, o whatever you need to say, like, yeah, yeah, so you need to say cha, like that, and, and goodbye as well, right. Uh, then, I can't speak to one well. Pivel up, Bill Bessman. Right, so, or f uh, you can see a uh, show look, right, as well, show look, right, means well, right, or you can say I can speak to one as well, right, so that's the little basic phrases that you can use, but of course right now um, I think nearly all to one people, they speak Russian as well, so more or less, and what is interesting is that uh, usually when you hear uh, somebody speaking to one. So for somebody who is a na uh, is a native language, so you 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 hear a lot of Russian words. So like beginning of the sentence starts in Tuvan, then Russian word, then again uh, continuation in Tuvan, then again Russian word. And uh, usually for such things as uh, as technology, as I said before, or medicine or something like science, so they they use a lot of Russian words, but uh, with a lot of affixations again. So um, and of course to. Uh, to study, if you want to study grammar or lexic or just read more about uh, about this language, you can see like Tvadil. Uh, so this is the textbook for for kids usually or for for students. So who who would love no, not for kids for students? I'm sorry. Who would love to um, to study that? Then it's like Vriminaya Sistema Tuvinskova Yazaka, so this is a tense system of Tuvan language. And this is the book I was telling you about where you can find a lot, uh, way more words about hunting, about, um, you know, like borrowings and so on. But as I said, it's in Russian, unfortunately. I, I, I didn't find it in, in English. So, and there's a topics of uh, phonology and morphology of Tuvan that was written in English. And let's learn to one. So with audio, which is cool, right? So uh, that was written. The last book was written by um, by a professor of Tuvan language in Kazil. So and it was uh, that was a particularly done on purpose for somebody for like um, English speakers, you know, who can uh, who can use that book to study. All right. And so what I can say is silerge chetirdim, which is like thank you so much. And thank you for your attention, right? If you need to, um, to, to learn more, or if you need any of this presentation or any materials um, connected with to one language, please contact me and I will be more than welcome to, to tell you about that, all right? Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please, I'm ready to answer. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's plural, right? Uh, yeah, it's like in Russian we have tivu, right? So this is the same. You 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 use plural to yeah, like vasha, right? To to indicate that you talk about uh, you respect other person. You don't say uh, ti, right? You, like uh, you say vu in this case. So this is the same. That's why it's plural. Mm -hmm. When Mongols did not control this territory anymore and uh, Chinese people also didn't control this, this territory. The thing was is that uh, half of people in Tuvan, uh, in Tuvan Republic, they wanted to s still be belong to Mongolia and half of them wanted to belong to uh, Soviet Union. And because they were not sure which part 
to, to take. So that's why during this period of time there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there were some conflicts and the conflicts were like within several years. And after, you know, Russia, Russia didn't push. You know, so the, we, the Russian Empire had trade, then Soviet Union had trade um, uh, with uh, this region, because the region is really rich with gold and um, fossil fuels. And the thing after that, uh, they like said, like, guys, you need to say who you are with, and they chose uh, Soviet Union. So, and basically, 1944 only, um, Tuva officially became, um, like, part of Soviet Union, but anyway, during this period of time, because my, my grandma was basically born in Tanutuva, right? And she said that this period of time, they that was everything in Cyrillic, everything in Russia. So they felt like in Russia, and the war, uh, Second World War started, and people of Tuva, they they actually joined uh, Red Army to go to, to the war. But like, uh, officially, they were uh, independent. So, but half of them already like were sure that they're gonna join it in 1944. Thank you so much. Thank you.